Um, well, I wanted to welcome our second speaker of the day. This is Deborah Elms. Uh, she is the founder and executive director of the Asian Trade Center. She's also the president of the Asia Business Trade Association. Um, I have to say, when I was talking to people for this program, um, whether in Singapore, Hong Kong, New York, London, all of them were like, have you talked to Deborah Elms? So just so you know, um, we are with an expert here. Um, so she is going to talk about, uh, her, her session today is decoding uh, the alphabet soup of Asian trade. So she'll be talking about all of those agreements with the many letters. Um, but she also, uh, as part of the Asian Trade Center, they publish uh, the Talking Trade blog, which uh, if you've looked at, covers a lot on digital trade. Um, and similar to uh, Bilahari, this is going to be, um, she'll, she'll speak first, but then we'll have a, a nice open discussion with lots of time for questions. So without further ado, Thanks. Dr. Evans. Thanks very much. I am very happy to be here. Um, when they said, would you please come and talk to reporters, I said, why? It's easier to do it all in one room than one at a time, so this is great <laughs> to have you all here. I um, hope you're enjoying your time in Singapore, and obviously you've got this stunning, I don't know how any of you can pay attention. If I had to face that way, I would be like not paying attention at all. Um, I always like this view too because for me, I mean I do trade obviously, but for me this is trade. Like look at all of the ships out in the harbor and all of the entertain like I mean, Marina Bay Sands which is there, which is all, uh, I call that the services complex, right? Because it's retail, it's hotel, it's casinos, it's everything related to services right there in front of you. So we have goods and services right out your window. But I suppose it shows you that I am ultimately a trade nerd because that's what I think of when I look out there and other people are like, wow, what a lovely view. <laughs> um, so what I'm going to do today is talk briefly about some of that, the alphabet in Asia for trade agreements. But I don't want to talk too long. I made a slideshow and then I thought, this is stupid. You don't want to watch slides. So I'm just going to talk and then you guys can ask me questions and that way I address what's really interesting to you. So let me just start with a couple of opening remarks just to get people a little bit up to speed because I noticed that you're from all over and not every one of you is following the same kinds of trade agreements in particular in part because some of you, I'm just looking at, at name tags, some of you are not involved, some of your governments are not involved or the countries where you're likely based are not involved so you don't pay much attention I'm guessing. So if you're not in a trade agreement, a regional trade agreement, though you are in the World Trade Organization, the WTO, which I will state at the front is the best option, right? It's much better for all of us if we had one set of rules, one set of requirements that applies to 164 members. Those are the rules. That's much easier. But the WTO has had a rough go of it um, since it, it launched from a previous organization in 1995. The WTO has really struggled. Uh, in all of that time, and I always say, you know, I've had staff that have been born and that have never seen the WTO be successful in their lifetimes, partly because my staff are young, but partly because that's how long it's been since the WTO really delivered results. So that's a problem. Uh, that is a problem for all of us, because if the WTO doesn't function like it should, then we don't have a consistent set of rules that govern trade in goods or services or in anything else. Um, the WTO, just as a, as a symbol of its dysfunction, launched in 1995, came out of the ashes of a previous organization in 1995. We still have no rules, really, globally, that govern anything digital. So, I mean, just think about, like, you know, in your lifetime, I'm just with y'all mostly young, some of you maybe have kids that are young. Uh, you know, in your lifetime, we have never successfully made digital rules at the global level. Like, that's appalling, right? <laughs> I mean, that's a long time to go with very little results. So it's been an institution that's been struggling. If you're interested, I can get into why it's been struggling. It has a lot of causes. We just held a ministerial that was able to trumpet a modest amount of, of, of success, but it's pretty modest. So um, in that world in which the WTO is not functioning as it should, the response by especially many governments in Asia has been, let's focus on other kinds of trade arrangements. Let's do bilateral agreements between two countries. Let's do bigger integration efforts. 
And unlike other parts of the world where trade has become an increasingly dirty word, in Asia, we still remain very committed to the idea of economic integration. And you can see that, again, sort of look out here. This is what economic integration results in. You know? I mean, you would not have a Singapore that looks like this if it wasn't economically integrated. And so we have lots of different efforts to engage. But before you get too, just too sort of dismayed at the number of acronyms and the number of trade deals that you have to follow, there are only a few that are actually, I would argue, really important. So let me just go through a couple of them briefly, and then again, I'm, ha I'm happy to take questions. So we sit in ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, which has been trying to economically integrate forever, and have, on some areas has been very successful, and on other areas less so. So successful things ASEAN has done, in between ASEAN members, we should have tariff-free coverage of goods. Sometimes inconsistent, but we should have it in place. Um, we should have an increasing amount of services and investment flows that are free. In fact, the headline sentence for the ASEAN Economic Community from 2015 said, ASEAN will have a free flow of goods, services, investments, skilled labor, and freer movement of capital. Now we're in 2022. We have not really most of those things. But in typical ASEAN fashion, we have declared it so, and so we now have all of those things, even if, practically speaking, we don't actually have those things. So they continue to integrate, but it is a challenging process, and again, I'm happy to talk more if you're interested in how ASEAN works about why it's been so hard for ASEAN members to actually deliver. Uh, mostly it has to do with domestic level issues and the structure of ASEAN, which is hard. It's a tough organization. It's complicated, it's sprawling, it has really diverse members, etc. So ASEAN integration has been going on for a long time. Increasingly, though, we have other kinds of economic integration, and I'm going to mention two in particular. One is actually meeting today, which is great, uh, the Comprehensive and Progressive Trans-Pacific Partnership, or CPTPP, is meeting today and tomorrow, I think, or yesterday and today, it's a little unclear to me, uh, in Tokyo, which is great to discuss uh, the management of this sprawling institution and the accession of new members. So CPTPP started back in earnest in 2010. Um, and at the time, it, it's a long and sorted history, but basically it went from a small organization, four members to seven to nine to 11 to 12, back to 11, and now we're currently at eight active members in the CPTPP. It is a comprehensive deal. I actually have the, this is the, this is the CPTPP. So you can see that it is dense. So it's like 600 pages of very small legal text. It's got 30 chapters in it. I can I can pass this around and take a look at it. Um, very dense, legally binding, almost the whole thing. Applies to all of the members equally, so that we don't have this practice that ASEAN has, which ASEAN calls the ASEAN minus X, which is somewhere between 10 and none of us actually do something, and there's no way to compel us to do something in ASEAN. Or what the WTO likes to call special and differential treatment, which is for developing countries and least developed countries, there are special flexibilities. CPTPP says if you're a member, you're a member. That's the rule book, follow it with a few small exceptions for timelines for some countries like Vietnam. So this is a very different kind of animal. It includes all goods. Every single product has had, and most of them have had, their tariffs dropped to zero already. Except for a few tiny exceptions. Cream cheese from Hokkaido, for some reason, mm -hmm. stays at 24.5% 4.9% forever. So kudos to the Hokkaido cheese people for successfully protecting their cheese. But everyone else is at zero. Now that is just, I cannot tell you how like, revolutionary that is in Asia for members to say, we're going to go to zero tariffs and we're going to stay there. And we're going to do it fast. So we're technically now on year four of the tariff cuts um, in uh, TPP. So almost everything is already tariff free. Every service. Every investment, sector and subsector, 160 sectors and subsectors of services, all open in TPP. Unless you have preserved uh, restrictions. And for most countries, they did not do very much. 
So there's some weird ones like you can't build an amusement park in Vietnam unless you spend a billion dollars. Um, you can't disassemble a car in Japan unless you're in Japan. And then some that are more meaningful around land restrictions, some issues around national defense, but by and large, all services, all investment open to TPP. They have very deep and comprehensive rules on intellectual property rights. They had an early and ambitious agreement uh, on electronic commerce, which is digital trade, around data issues, financial services. So this is a very important integration effort. Now, it's had a rough road. Because when it closed, you may recall, the US president at the time pulled out on his first full day in office. And it looked like this entire exercise was, was doomed to the trash heap. But it was resurrected, especially by Shinzo Abe out of Japan, uh, who pushed it through. And they renamed it this horrible, comprehensive, and progressive. That was the Canadians, not the Japanese, who renamed it. And we now have CPTPP in place. So it's been in place since late, since late 2018. And it's currently undergoing accession. So the UK is in the middle. In fact, today, part of the meeting in Tokyo is to discuss UK's application to join the TPP. Um, the UK will tell you that they're almost done. The other members will tell you they're a little less done than they want it to be. So, but we're close. Like maybe, I don't know how far. It depends on how well this week went. But maybe within the year, we will have the UK in the TPP. There are also, and this is another big point for um, certain for journalists, more members that want to join. So we have formal applications already in from China, Taiwan, and Ecuador, and expect one from the Koreans. So we have more members that want to join this agreement. So it's, a, it's an important agreement that, that is worth following, delivers actual economic benefits. I always say to companies, if you come to me, I will find you markets. I will save you costs. I don't care what it is you do or where you do it. TPP allows me to make And so far, I've never been wrong on that issue, right? So CPTPP really uh, the model in that sense for an ambitious, deep and broad trade integration exercise uh, that is continuing to grow. Now, not every country is a member of CPTPP. It's too deep. It's too broad. It's too ambitious for a lot of countries. Um, and so it was born out of the APEC process, another acronym the Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation um, with 21 member economies, all of whom could have joined TPP at the time and then CPTPP. Uh, many of them, as you can see, clearly didn't choose to join because we have only eight in out of the 21 members out of APEC. They didn't join again for lots of reasons, but part of it was just the ambition level was too high for a lot of APEC economies. And they did not want to engage in an exercise that was going to be problematic for them. So we only ended up at the end with eight current members. Um, in ASEAN, we have two, so Singapore and Vietnam, plus Japan, Australia, New Zealand. On the other side of the ocean is Peru, which is the latest member, uh, Canada, and Mexico. So we'll see how the CPTPP evolves, but it's a very important agreement um, and continues to be in the headlines, especially as it expands. Because not everybody could be part of CPTPP, but because they wanted to continue economic integration, ASEAN pushed for the expansion of ASEAN's own integration in the region. So ASEAN has what it calls ASEAN plus one agreements. So this is ASEAN China, ASEAN Korea, ASEAN Japan. There's six of them now. Uh, one is with Australia and New Zealand altogether. Um, and one that came in, in the, relatively recently with no fanfare with Hong Kong. So we have six. And the idea behind, behind ASEAN was it's very difficult to use five different agreements, to have them all lined up, and then they have different rules around them, even in trade and goods, uh, different provisions, different coverage. It's really hard to do that. Wouldn't it be great if we could just lay them all out on a table? We could pick up what's in common, and bing. We have a huge thing, which was then called the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, or RCEP, done. Be fast, it'd be easy. They said three years maximum. It took eight. <laughs> it took eight years to get RCEP done. Uh, and RCEP came into force for most of the members in January of this year. So it's brand new. It looks <coughs> like if I were to, well, we still haven't done it, but we will print out probably at some point the text for RCEP because it would be nice to have it in book form. Um, RCEP 
looks very much like CPTPP. It's a little shorter. Instead of 600 pages, it's about 500 pages. It has the same thousands of pages of country-specific schedules, goods, services, investment, um, rules around mobility. So there's some very specific things that governments agreed to do. Um, but it is not quite as broad and not quite as deep as CPTPP. So instead of 30 chapters, it has 20. It has a lot more exceptions and a lot more flexibility uh, in RCEP than TPP does. It has less coverage, so not every good is covered. In particular, in RCEP, we have bunches of exceptions in agricultural products. They're always sensitive. We have variation in services coverage and investment coverage. It has an e-commerce chapter that is awful. It has an intellectual property rights chapter, which is great, actually really ambitious, like shockingly ambitious. So it's a, it's a mixed bag, but it's finished, and it's now in force for 12 countries. So we're still missing three. Uh, Indonesia, Philippines, and Myanmar have not yet ratified. Fingers crossed, end of this year, they, they claim they will get it done. I'm not holding my breath, but we'll see. Um, and then we would have all of them in, uh, all 15 in, and we will continue to see how RCEP evolves. RCEP has very long timelines, like, ridiculously long, but I assume some of those will be brought forward and shortened and made more ambitious over time as everybody gets comfortable with the idea of being engaged. Uh, so we'll see what happens with RCEP. But that's an important agreement worth following. Um, and it, it opens for accession next summer, and Hong Kong has already put its hand up to be one of the first countries in the RCEP accession process. So we'll see how RCEP evolves. Let me talk about a couple of more things very quickly, very briefly, and then I'm going to open it up for questions. So one that no one pays attention to is what the Europeans are doing. The EU is very active in the region and becoming increasingly active. And it has a number of agreements with Asian governments on a bilateral basis. So we have EU Singapore, EU Vietnam, and ASEAN. With Japan, with Korea, with Australia now, and New Zealand are the latest two that they're in the middle of finishing up. So there are lots of efforts by the European Union. They have restarted some of their bilateral or re-engaged or in renewed enthusiasm for bilaterals with countries like Indonesia. And eventually the EU wants to move to an EU ASEAN FTA. So pay attention a little bit, I think, to what the EU is up to because it's an interesting new way to integrate. Um, for, from Asia's perspective, one challenge with EU negotiating and EU agreements is the EU insistence on their sustainable trade and sustainable development chapter, which includes things like environment, gender, human rights, can be very problematic for Asian governments. I'm, again, happy to talk about why that is um, in the Q&A. So pay attention to Europe. We also have a growing number of digital agreements, which, sadly for our alphabet soup discussion, all have different names. So we have two versions of these. We have one called the Digital Economy Partnership Agreement, or DEPA, which is a, an, think of it as an independent, standalone agreement on digital. Right now, it includes Singapore, Chile, and New Zealand, with the Koreans in accession for DEPA, formally in accession, and the Canadians announced that they also want to join. So we'll see when or how fast the Koreans come in and then what happens to Canada. So DEPA independent. The whole agreement has to stand by itself. It has a range of commitments. It has come into force. It took a very long time. The Chilean government, you may have noticed, keeps falling. This was an issue for getting DEPA into place. And nobody's really implemented it. But lots of people think it's very exciting. Lots of these modules. And the way that DEPA was supposed to work is that you could either join DEPA as a whole, the whole thing, or you could take a piece of it out and put it in your own agreement. And then that way we would replicate the same kinds of rules in different ways. So top down, bottom up, we would start to make global rules on digital, or at least regional rules or rules that were more than we have now. So that was the idea behind DEPA. It's proven to be a bit challenging to do in practice. So they have now turned to an alternative way, driven by Singapore, of digital economy agreements, DEAs. The difference between the DEAs and DEPA is that the DEAs are hooked to a larger agreement. So there's an existing bilateral between us, 
and we do this sort of digital chapter that becomes part of the free trade agreement. Now the advantage of a DEA is we already have all that FTA stuff. We've already talked about goods and services and investment and probably intellectual property rights and standards and all sorts of stuff. We have a dispute settlement system in our bilateral agreement. So we don't have to do that again. We just focus on the digital rules. And then we get the benefits of all of that FTA stuff as well. So this DEA model, very attractive to many governments. Singapore has now signed one first with Australia, then with the UK, with the Koreans. Others are in process. So we see this, this model expanding, and now it's expanding in other ways too. So the UK says they're going to start replicating these DEAs as well. And eventually maybe we get like a network of digital commitments. And we end up with digital rules that might help when the global system is not functioning as well as it should, and certainly not for digital. And then the last one that I'm going to talk about, and then I'm going to open up for questions, is something that you should not think of as a trade agreement. Okay? I know you love to do this as a reporters. We love to say that the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, or IPEF, is a trade agreement to replace U.S. participation in TPP. It is not. IPEF could be an important thing. It's early days, it's hard to say. Uh, they met here in Singapore last week and uh, got a little more clarity on what it is. But IPEF is a framework. So if, I think it's better if you say in your head, IPEF is a framework that discusses some topics of relevance to trade, but it does not cover, actually if you look at the TPP contents, for example, almost nothing in the TPP is in IPEF. So what does IPEF then do? I could spend a lot of time on this, but I'll make it very short. It, unclear, because it depends on what the members want. We have 14 governments currently active in IPEF, and the US is claiming that that's it. We're not taking new members, we'll see. Uh, and it does four things. The first pillar is called trade, but it doesn't really cover most of the things we normally do in trade. There's nothing goods, no services, no investment, no intellectual property rights, really nothing on standards. Yeah, there's kind of, it's, it doesn't look like it's nothing trade remedy. Like all of the chapters that are in that TPP are not in IPEF. So what does it do? It looks at digital, in, uh, labor, but by labor the Americans mean worker rights, not like movement of people. So worker rights. It covers environment, competition. Corruption. That's a separate pillar. So in the trade pillar, it's the, the gender, indigenous, so there's 10 things now active, but none of them are sort of traditional trade. Again, it doesn't mean that they're not important, but I'm just saying to you, this is not a trade deal, even when it's called trade. Like that, what's in there is not what we typically think of as trade. There are three other pillars that are being driven by the Commerce Department out of the US. Resilient supply chains, still unclear what that will look like. Um, green infrastructure. Also, I'm not sure exactly what the green infrastructure as opposed to other infrastructure, but green infrastructure. And the fourth pillar that you were mentioning on tax and anti-corruption. So those are the four pillars of IPEF. The negotiations started in week start, soft launch, I suppose we would say. Last week here, with the members actually at the working level starting to have a conversation about what does this look like. We will have a ministerial I think the plan is to have a virtual ministerial first and then have an actual in-person ministerial kind of meeting in LA in September to discuss the launch of this thing, like the formal launch of negotiations. Um, but again, don't think of it as a trade agreement, it's an integration framework that may or may not have trade related things in it. Um, so that's the, the last piece of my alphabet soup. So we have the WTO, the global trade organization still creaking along, poorly, sadly, but it's creaking. And then all of these regional efforts, bilaterally, regionally, within Asia, across Asia and the Pacific, uh, in the digital space. <coughs> they don't have to be regionally uh, uh, continued anymore, as you can see from UK accession. Uh, and so we have, again, it's sort of members that want to push integration and do so in ways that are different or innovative or ambitious or not um, across this region. So all of that effort continues. I think it's, I and mean, that's why I stay in Asia all this time, because 
this is where we're actually getting stuff done, as opposed to other places where we just don't get as much done on trade. Uh, so it's been very exciting, but it's also challenging to keep an eye on what's happening because it changes a lot. So with that, let me open it to things that you want to talk about. Go ahead. Sure. So uh, Ben Westcott from Bloomberg in Australia. Uh, thank you so much for that. There's a million questions I could ask, but I'm going to just stick to one or one and two parts. Um, you said that the CPTPP has uh, sort of delivered uh, actual economic benefits. It's a very important integration effort. But is there any way to sort of quantify that? Is there a is there a percentage of GDP or is there a dollar figure that we can put to those benefits? And just in the second part to that, why did so many economists from different sides of the political aisle hate the TPP mm. in the first place? So much so that the US left. Okay. I'm Shruti from Bloomberg Delhi. Uh, so my question is, you know, India pulled out of RCEP uh, because of concerns of being flooded by Chinese goods, right? Uh, now, as we see after Russia-Ukraine war, we see shift, shifting supply chains. Uh, in hindsight, was it a good decision for India? I mean, uh, and how does it play with the whole integration thing? Because there's diversification happening, and then you're saying that there is integration also happening. And countries are largely saying, you know, locally we should produce and we should, you know, cater to the domestic economy first. So how does it play with the whole integration thing? Mm. My second question is, you know, in the EU signed FTA with Vietnam, and now India and EU are also negotiating an FTA. So uh, the same things would come, sustainability chapter, labor, labor issues. Uh, do you think that India can f get some leeway there uh, when it comes to EU's uh, you know, high standard on sustainability and issues like gender equality, mm -hmm. labor laws? Is that possible? And how will you know, insistence on data localization you know, be a hindrance in India's mm -hmm. whole getting into the digital agreements? Mm -hmm. Some excellent questions. Okay, so I'm gonna, I have two, so CPTPP and then India in particular. I've got two more before you, but I'll come. I'll make this as quick as I can. On CPTPP, do we have the numbers? Unfortunately, one of the challenges we've had on numbers for CPTPP has been timing. So it came into force in the very end of 2018. Uh, and then we had, so that was the first round of tariff cuts was December 30th of 2018. Second round of tariff cuts was January 1st. So we had two, ye two years of tariff cuts happen in two days. It was kind of a miscalculation by the members. They started earlier than they meant to, and then everyone went, oops, okay, well, whatever. But the point is that we, we didn't have a lot of data pre-COVID. So one of the challenges that we have had around TPP is figuring out what is TPP related, what is COVID disruption and COVID related, and then remember at the time, end of 2018, beginning of 2019, Lots of U.S.-China trade war stuff. So there are sort of complications that make pulling the data out challenging because you, what is clearly TPP and what is not, hard to say. It's particularly challenging in TPP because normally when we have a trade agreement, there's a, there's a piece of paper that you need to say at customs, this is what I'm using in order to, to claim the benefits, in this case tariff-free concessions. Um, and so you could count those pieces of paper. And then you would say, oh, this is the number of companies or this is the amount of trade that, at least in goods, that came through using that agreement. But TPP uses self-certification, so you just declare it. The paper is less, there's no document. So they're not tracking that document, which means it's really hard to see on trade goods. And it's really a nightmare to figure out statistics on trade services and investment at the best of times. And so like, what's the added value? We can point to anecdotal evidence, particularly around areas that weren't covered before. Vietnam, Canada trades through the roof. But it could be lots of things, right? It could be TPP, it could be US-China trade war, it could be lots of COVID restrictions changing. So hard to unpack what's what. Why did people dislike the TPP? Be a couple of reasons. One is that I think it was framed poorly, but two, because anytime you have integration, there is strong concerns by some that this will negatively affect their markets. And TPP in particular felt very alarming to some because it's so deep and comprehensive. And so, you know, what is the level of competition that our domestic firms will face? Maybe it's going to be too much for us and maybe we will end up being overrun. As it happens, I mean, as much as I like trade agreements, you know, they're very hard to use. And ultimately, companies don't typically 
follow the rules of the trade agreement like you might imagine. So you might imagine that everybody and their brother would be doing this, but we find, unfortunately, a lot of them don't understand it, don't know about it, can't do it properly, and they leave these benefits on the table. So you could have lots of competition. I think we see less than we should, but that's because of confusion and lack of knowledge and poor planning by companies. Compounded by this time frame. Very hard to get anybody to do something differently under the COVID situation, etc. On India, India's decision to leave RCEP was a disaster. I said so repeatedly at the time. I continue to say so. So India had an agreement with ASEAN, and that's why it was part of the original RCEP calculation. So we had 16 countries negotiating for eight years. They got the deal done. They had this incredible event in Bangkok in which all of the leaders stood up. They did this sort of you know, handshake. Modi stood up, gave this fiery speech in Hindi, in which he said, there is no way in hell we will ever join RCEP. <laughs> it was in Hindi, nobody knew. So they thought it was a fiery speech that was like how excited India was about joining. And it wasn't until the next day that most of them got the transcripts and went, what the hell, you dropped out. Like, we, ju we just did this whole thing. Our pictures are 16 of us. This is bad. So yeah, he, Modi said no. Uh, and the reason that he said no was because of concerns about domestic level uh, competitions. In particular, because of having gone to all of these RCEP rounds, I can tell you, every Indian group, I don't care what they were, <coughs> agricultural people, textile people, steel people, whoever they were, they would say, we think RCEP is an awesome idea. Great idea, absolutely India should be in, but not for my sector. <laughs> so every single sector said, this is awesome, not us. And there was really no one in India that was out in front saying, yeah, we really do need this. We're not going to be competitive. We're very poorly plugged into supply chains. This gives us an opportunity to do that. And so in the end, they pulled out. And I think this is a real missed opportunity. And it's a missed opportunity, I would argue, for two reasons. First, because you missed that opportunity to integrate with supply chains that I think will be reset in the wake of RCEP. Of course, we already have Asian supply chains. But increasingly now, it is easier to move things in Asia for Asia, rather than in Asia for the US or in Asia for Europe. You'll do it in Asia for Asia. RCEP makes that easier. India just pulled itself out. Why? Uh, so that's one, one challenge. And then the second problem that India could have tackled but chose not to is to use the RCEP process to leverage domestic level reforms that are needed but hard. So I get this question, I used to get this question a lot around Vietnam and TPP, because Vietnam joined TPP, and many people said, whoa, are you crazy? This is a country that can't possibly, too ambitious, they're not advanced developing country, like that, wow. Vietnam's government said, we have to make some painful reforms, we know that. Really hard for us to do. So how are we gonna do that? Well, one way to do it is to get ourselves into a much bigger deal and say, I would love to protect you. I would love to continue to give you favorable whatever. But unfortunately, all of these people over here are telling me I can't do it anymore. And so what can I do? Many governments use these trade agreements as the tool to force domestic level reforms. And I think India could have and should have done so because it def definite, definitely needs <laughs> some domestic level reforms. So you could have done that. They did not. I think that's a missed opportunity. That means that India is out of this sort of integration game, and will probably stay out. It has an opportunity to come back in, but that's really a non-starter in India right now to talk about RCEP participation. And the more that you have integration take place in supply chains in Asia, the harder it is for Indian firms to participate in those integration efforts. It's just it's the way that it is. So you can imagine, sometimes I think of these trade agreements as like a club, right? You join the club. You have the benefits of being in the club. You meet with each other regularly. You develop relationships with one another. And if you're doing something similar, but you're not in the club, of course you could do something on your own that replicates what the club does, but it's not the same thing, and it's not the same level of connections that you would get. So huge missed opportunity for India. Um, but they just have really strong domestic level constraints that make it, they would argue, impossible to do anything else. I, uh Frame from uh, UK. Yes. I'm based in Kuala Lumpur. So I just want to get your thoughts on uh, uh, the 
the, the design of uh, agreements like CPTPP, uh, when it was TPP before this, uh, some view it as overstepping boundaries uh, in certain segments of the agreement. For example, like IPs or uh, equality, and that's the main purpose why countries like Malaysia have not ratified the agreement. Uh, you know, they, they are afraid of uh, touching sensitivities of the communities in the country. So, do you think this is the trend moving forward mm. where it's going to be a comprehensive package mm. where it touches every aspect of uh, the country? Or is it going, you know, is it the lesson that they learned from uh, TPP negotiations? And also, uh, there is a school of thought which says uh, WTO might, uh, you know, might lose its relevance sooner or later uh, because of this binding uh, multilateral agreements that are going on. Uh, which are which are self-standing on their own. They don't need WTO to regulate. So, what are your thoughts on mm, that? Okay. Your question. You had the microphone, right? Um, hi, I'm Hee-jin from Bloomberg News mm. and from Seoul, South Korea. Mm. I just want to ask you about the South Korea's participation ah. in the CP, uh, CPTPP. CPTPP yeah. Sorry. Yes. And uh, actually, farmers are hard, strongly protesting against the idea. Of course. They are staging a protest almost every day. Yeah, so I just because you mentioned the agriculture industry yes. is a sensitive one, so I just want to know how other countries, in terms of this issue, resolved this kind mm. of protest previously. And my second question is just how do you generally see South Korea in terms of handling this kind of all kinds of you know tax? Yes. Okay, so let me take those two. We we'll start with the Korean one. Korea was an early convert to integration. But the way that Korea did it was called hub and spokes. So basically they said, let's, we're already an integrated economy. Let's make sure that with our key trading partners, we have bilateral deals that give us the benefits that we think we need. So hub and spokes with Korea at the center. And that served Korea quite well, but it is also challenging to you. So people ask me all the time, why, what's wrong with the bilateral? The big problem with the bilateral is think about something like this microphone thing. If we have a bilateral trade agreement, depending on how we write this, we may need to source, again, the rules are all different, but 40% of the content of this thing has to be added, the value of the content has to be added between the partners. If there's only two of us, that means that you and I have to have enough parts, components, raw materials, and value addition to hit 40. That can be very hard. I mean, I don't know how many parts are in this thing, but I assume it's actually more than it looks. And that can be really challenging to meet. So increasingly, that hub and spokes model doesn't work very well, and bilaterals don't work as well. They're just hard to use. They're hard to use for companies. I mean, look, if you're not using TPP, then you sure as hell are not using some of the bilaterals, because like, you just don't have that kind of knowledge. So, Having the hub and spokes needs to move to having these regional deals, but Korea has consistently missed the boat. So the Koreans, sadly for them, on TPP in particular, have now twice had an election and a government reorganization at the very moment when they were preparing to get in. <laughs> and I think the second time, which is right now, they're going to miss it again. Like, ah, oh, such a shame, because they should be in. But it is complicated. TPP is particularly complicated. Agriculture is one of the areas that's challenging. It's challenging in every trade agreement. The, the most organized, most protected group in any society is farmers. They are, all, in every, in, including in Singapore, where we have almost none, they still continue to have incredible amounts of power for having, like, you know, three people that grow chickens. So it's just, it is what it is. So how do you deal with that? Well, one way to do so is to make the benefits overall bigger. So even if you lose here, you win there. In agriculture, you might win, lose some ag, but you could potentially pick up a different market. TPP is particularly challenging because it's zero tariffs, including on all agricultural products. That is a big change. So they always protest. And ultimately, it's a political will question. Are you going to stand up to these guys, or you're not going to stand up to these guys? Every country that's in has had the same issue, Japan as well. Uh, other countries that are in accession, Taiwan's got the same problems if they come in. So agriculture, always sensitive, just ultimately you have to bite the bullet, I think, and just make it happen. Um, so that's been a bit of a challenge on Korea. TPP, we'll see. New government, new trade minister. I happen to be a big fan of new trade minister, so let's hope that he does great things. But that's because I've known him for a very long time, and so that's fingers crossed that he's good. Um, we'll see where the Korea gets in. 
Your question was on, remind me one more time, sorry, I had it and then I just lost it. I mean, uh, the design of the design. Agreements. The design of these agreements. Um, uh, and on, this, on the social inclusion stuff. Yes. So, ultimately we, get, we start with a basic question, which is what is a tra trade agreement for? When I look at a trade agreement, I say, what is it for? For me, it's about facilitating trade. Trade in goods, services, investment, potentially flows of people, the things that you need in order to make trade work. The more stuff we, and, and there's a good reason why people want to add things on, because they say, first of all, trade seems to be functioning better than other things. There are lots of things that are connected to trade. So you move goods around, there are issues around what safety standards and appropriate levels of contamination or pesticides or whatever. There's lots of things we could add. So you could add a lot of things to that trade agenda. But I always worry that the more we load up a trade deal, especially like a Christmas tree, the more we end up with that agreement like a Christmas tree just sort of flopping over. <laughs> Because ultimately, it can't bear the weight of all the ornaments that you're sticking on the tree, right? I mean, every time that you say, well, what if we add in gender? What if we add in indigenous? What if we add in all sorts of things around the environment? What if we add in worker rights? But like things like minimum wage laws or overtime laws or whatever. Like there's a lot of things we could add we really just overburden our little tree and it falls over. Plus, in my view, we then contribute to the backlash against trade. Because having promised that you're gonna do all these things, put all the ornaments on the tree, when you fail to deliver, which you will fail to deliver, people then say, well, these trade agreements and trade sucks. Because it didn't give us gender equality and it didn't give us a clean environment and it didn't give us all the stuff that was promised in these trade deals. So everybody ends up grumpy. Like the environmentalists are mad because there's not enough environment, and the gender folks are mad there's not enough gender, and the trade people are like, but now I can't do anything. So I think it's a, I think it's a real challenge. Unfortunately, for political reasons, for many markets, it's not going away. Which is how we've ended up with this IPEF pillar, for example, which is now ballooning out. Even the trade one is now 10. Because everybody wants to add their thing, and everybody says, my domestic process will not allow me to accept this thing unless it has all this other stuff. Which I think it could be true. And then we're, I don't know where we go from there really. Um, I don't know whether that's genuinely true or whether that's sort of an excuse that we're using. But definitely it's coming, it's a problem. And if you think it was bad already, you can imagine as we really deal with the implica trade implications of climate especially, this becomes a real challenge because now we have to genuinely address some hard issues around trade and carbon and environmental sustainability and so forth. That is going to be very difficult. But I, I, I don't know how to solve that particular problem. Okay, let me take some more questions. We have one here with the microphone and one here. Thank you. My question is linked to Mr. McLean. Yes. Some of the developing countries are still heavily dependent on WTO minister decisions. And in the last ministerial decisions, uh, reforming WTO, uh, it came in the agenda. So do you think uh, reforming WTO can bring some result or make it, it effective, especially uh, regarding dispute settlement? Mm -hmm. Some of the developing countries are still heavily dependent on the WTO yes. decisions. Great. So, That's a great question. So WTO and developing countries. Yes, here. With the current situation, we, we heard yesterday that we're moving away from ultra-globalization. Ultra and so is what, what India did with RSAP more reflective of today's trade appetites around mm. the world? And perhaps these multilateral agreements are coming to an end. Or maybe it continues, but countries like China can kiss their application to see CPTPP goodbye because we're into French shoring, we're into friendly relations and alliances. Mm. Great questions. Let me take your question. Hi, my name is Shakur. I'm from Press Trust of India, Delhi. Mm -hmm. So my question is, uh, do you think the IPEF will uh, complement or displace the existing economic institutions in the region? And also, you know, how much of an impact do you think the carbon taxes are going to have on trade? 
especially in ASEAN? Great, great set of questions. Okay, so let me start with the developing country and WTO because it ties a little bit to this one. Yes, developing countries especially need the WTO. And there are large regions or parts of regions where if you don't have a functioning WTO, you have nothing. So the example I often give is it's, you know, sometimes you're just not an attractive dance partner. For whatever reason, you're just not. Either your region doesn't work properly, or you yourself don't bring a whole lot to that dance, or whatever, but you're just not an attractive dance partner. So you can't get into bilateral or regional agreements. They're just not available for you. So then what do you do? You really do need to have a functioning global system. And I worry a lot about the slow and sad collapse of the WTO because, precisely because, if it collapses, it will harm the poorest people in the worst places uh, who desperately need to have some stable foundation for trade. And I worry, even though, of course, obviously I spend a lot of time on regional deals and so forth, that if we set trade around these regional deals, then we have clearly carved up and excluded some of the folks, which gets to your question a bit. And that's very problematic if you're not in. Right? As you set up supply chains to take advantage of some of these regional agreements, then if you're not part of those regional agreements, the damage is even bigger. And it's true that you say, well, I have these regional deals, so I don't care. But actually, all of those regional deals are built on top of the WTO's rules. So even with the TPP, 600 pages of rules, that sits on top of or alongside the WTO's rule book. You have to read the two of them together because what the TPP doesn't do is it doesn't repeat WTO commitments. It says that's the floor, that's the foundation, we're going to build on top of that with the TPP. If the foundation is gone, then you're screwed. Now we all have to rebuild the foundation in whatever way we can, shore it up, come up with something. It's a real problem. So we need to have the WTO, particularly for developing countries. I think that's absolutely vital. On the question of globalization, I hear this a lot. Globalization is dead, globalization is in retreat. And I say, have you talked to any companies? You know, if you're a company, it's one thing for journalists or for politicians who love to say, you know, globalization is dead, to say so. Or you must follow our policies. You're a whatever country, company in my country. You should follow. Of course, your national interest is our national interest. You should act as if you were whatever. And I think, well, maybe you haven't talked to any companies lately, because companies do not generally see themselves as State Department officials. They see themselves as businesses. They need to go out and ultimately, what do they need to do? They need to make money. If you're a business and you're doing something for other than business reasons, you're losing money. Now, you can do that for a certain amount of time or for a certain period, but ultimately, you need to be in business to make money to stay in business. So governments who say so, so sort of you know, cavalierly, you won't do that because you, know, you just won't because it's not in our national interest, I think really, so what are you going to give them the money that they need in order to make this adjustment? So a co company might even in their own mind say, actually this is not very helpful for us, we really should change our footprint, we should think about a different investment. On a practical level, it's been very hard. It's expensive. It's difficult to change your supply chain footprint often. And you're facing very high inflation. You're facing global uncertainty. Is this the moment when a company goes, you know what, we're flush with cash, most of them are not. We're going to suddenly restructure because it has been told to us that globalization is dead and that we must emphasize our national interests. I don't think that's true. But I understand the, the seductive nature of the narrative. So I think what we need to do is a better job of asking companies, what are you actually doing? And when you go out and you talk to companies, what are you doing? It turns out most of them are not doing anything. They're thinking about maybe doing something, but they haven't really pulled the trigger to deliver. Even when the situation is getting rockier, it's not rocky enough that most of them say, OK, that's it. We're going to pull out of, except for notable exception, of course, is Russia. Other than that, and even that has actually made it harder for many multinationals because they say, whoa, we just lost our Russia business. And so at a time where you know, potentially a lot of our business or part of our business is now zero, we really can't afford to suddenly reshuffle our supply chains in this region. It's just too difficult. It's too expensive. And to what? Where are we going to go? 
what are we going to do? You know, I talk to firms all the time who are like, well, we really don't really, we may not really want to be in China, but why are we in China? We're in China because they do stuff better than anyone else. Ultimately, they have that whole infrastructure. So you say to them, you know what, I want this thing to be in pink. And it's in pink in a prototype in your hand in 24 hours. And then you look at it and you go, I don't like this pink, make it a different pink. And then it's back in your hands in 24 hours. And then you say, fantastic, I want 10,000 of them on Friday, and boom, you have them. Who else does that? Nobody. So ultimately, firms are making decisions based on, like, I have to stay in business. Now, what they are doing, to give a little bit of credence to this argument about globalization, if I had $100 I wanted to invest, where would I put it? And for many firms, they're saying, I'm not going to either do what we've always done, or I may not reinvest in places that we're already in. I may invest in other locations. But they're not moving as much as you might imagine, given the narrative that we have. And your question, remind me again. About the IPEF, you know, oh, yeah, IPEF. Well, IPEF, Will IPEF replace anything? No, I don't think so. I mean, IPEF should, IPEF in my view at the moment, and again, it's early days, we don't know, should be thought of more like APEC. So APEC will tell you, what, what do they do at APEC? It's a non-binding uh, organization that is an incubator of ideas. I think in a way that's IPEC. Like, let's think about some of these new issues. Let's think about what rules we might develop. Let's think about whether or not we can make those rules, and if we do, how will we make those rules? So think of it in my view more as this framework, right? We're thinking about new issues, new topics, and from there, we might have lots of different things happen. But is it going to replace anything? Not at the moment. And particularly, I would argue, institutions are sticky. So if I have a trade ministry, my trade ministry is set up how? My trade ministry has a goods team, services team, investment team. It has, so those are the sort of you know, functional teams, standards, intellectual property rights, whatever. I also have teams by countries or regions. So Europe and Africa and ASEAN and whatever. I'm not going to just suddenly throw all of that out and say, you know, actually now we're going to have a completely different team that does gender, and we're not going to worry about the good services and investment stuff. So I think it will be a challenge to do, IPEF in my view is going to be hard, and it's actually going to be hard, not because the topic is necessarily hard, but think about the domestic level coordination that I have to do. If I just think about the trade pillar on IPEF, trade pillar on IPEF I need to think about digital, Many countries now have a digital economy minister with a digital economy ministry. There are lots of agencies that do digital, my cybersecurity people, my national security people. So just to talk about digital, I have to go out and coordinate with you know, five or 10 different ministries. If I then add to that something like environment, we don't all have an environment ministry. We may have an agriculture ministry. We may have a, some climate somebody. They all have to be brought in just to deal with environment. Labor, labor rights, that's a whole nother. I don't even know in some countries who you call, but whoever those people are, they're going to have to be invited to the table. There's a, a thing on um, competition. So now I need to bring in the competition authorities, attorney general's chambers, law ministry. Those people have to come. If we're going to talk about gender, I don't even know who you call in a lot of governments on gender. It's not really handled outside of Canada now, Australia. Uh, as a thing. So how do we get somebody together to do, I mean, the, just the logistics around trying to deal with this 10-part IPEF, I think is going to be intense. So I do not expect it to replace anything. But again, it could surface some issues that then maybe we pick up and we put somewhere else in a trade deal or we put in another something. So I'm not suggesting that it's a terrible idea. I just think it's not a trade deal in the way that we think of trade deals. Maybe that's the future. Maybe people say, actually, this is the pinnacle of trade deals, right? Because this is 600 pages of legally binding stuff, and actually, we're not that fond of that anymore, so we're going to throw this out, and we're just going to do cooperation stuff. And maybe that's the future, so we're just going to cooperate. And if that's the future, then maybe IPEF is the future. I don't know yet. At the moment, I would say there's too many, in my view, too many vested interests in this kind of thing for it to shift in the near term. But maybe, maybe people get very passionate about alternative approaches. Other questions? I think I have just a minute, right? 
Hi, I'm Maria from CNBC Indonesia. Mm. Uh, what is the biggest risk for Indonesia to join in CPTPP? Because our government say that we're not ready because it's too white and it's too liberal and it's also against our domestic system. Mm. This is Dal from the Wall Street Journal. Um, I'm curious if you can talk a little bit, uh, a little bit about the export ban uh, as more countries use that as a tool to control, uh, you know, either price domestically. Is that a violation of any kind of trade agreement? Okay, let's start with the last one first. No. And the reason why export bans are not a violation of, of agreement is at the time that they were setting up the original GATT, now the WTO, the idea that you would ban exports was crazy. No, no one in their right mind would ban exports. What you wanted was to export. That's what you were trying to accomplish, was to export more. So the, the idea that someone would think it was a good idea to stop that, stop selling things to someone else and making it at home and generating the revenue from making the thing at home and then selling it to some foreigner, was like not going to happen. So there is no rule on export bans. There was a discussion about it early in the CPT in the TPP negotiations about we should have a chapter on this. And even then, in 2010, people said, "Why? Well, what do we need that for? That's so bizarre. Of course, we're going to continue to export." And it's only now that people are like, "Wait a second, maybe we should have something that at least makes the rules a little more clear." And part of that has to do with the sort of collapsing norms of how we handle trade, where all kinds of things that you didn't think you were going to see, have you seen? <laughs> Including, you know, national security arguments used for, like, you know, banning automobiles. Um, so there is a eroding <coughs> norm, I think, which is creating this opening for export bans, which we didn't see before. Eventually, if people keep doing it, we would, I assume, people will say, well, let's make some rules on that. Let's at least write down the conditions under which it's acceptable and the conditions under which we don't think it's acceptable. Or have some notification or transparency about it, or let's beef up what we have to make it more clear for export bans. On Indonesia, Indonesia should first get into RCEP, because that's embarrassing, right? You have the ASEAN Secretariat and you haven't actually approved RCEP. So first, RCEP. On TPP, why is it too ambitious? Um, there are a lot of policies that Indonesia is currently running that are counter to CPTPP. It would discipline many of those behaviors. So you cannot have domestic content requirements of all kinds under CPTPP. You can't have domestic content on data, you can't have domestic content on manufacturing, on green, on all sorts of stuff. Uh, unless you have very specific criteria in that. So I think for Indonesia, CPTPP would be a tough one. I actually have higher hopes of China getting into CPTPP at the moment than Indonesia. Because I think the Chinese could do it and probably will come into CPTPP. We'll see how this evolves uh, compared to Indonesia, which I think, again, headed in the wrong direction and an election cycle, which is going to be heavily protectionist because it is every time we have an Indonesian election. So I think that's the wrong direction for Indonesia to join. CPTPP, but they could certainly get RCEP done. And if they don't, that, again, for me, that's embarrassing. You're the ASEAN chair, and they want to put the secretariat, I think, in Jakarta, and you're going to lose that, because why would I put a secretariat in a country that isn't a member? So hopefully Indonesia will get RCEP done, and then it can think about implementing RCEP, because Indonesia's implementation of things is always weak. Focus on that, and then you could potentially move towards CPTPP at some distant point. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Elms, for joining us. I'm happy to answer. If you have any other questions or whatever, you know, always you can reach out. Uh, we have lots of trades that you can imagine because we run a trade center. Lots of trade stuff on our website and lots of trade on our social media sites as well. So if you're interested, please follow. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs>